Great to be back at Truth Talk and talking about some things that are on our hearts and minds. First of all, let me say that it is summertime and July has been an exciting time for me and for Truth Church. Uh, we got to go to Peak and thankful for that meeting and the profound impact it has on the Pentecostal movement at large. And shout out to uh, Zach Wells and the Youth Council for an excellent conference. And the preaching was just par excellence. Okay, and then uh, I've been ranching all month long and training colts and having a wonderful time. It's one of my favorite things to do in the world is uh, to start colts. It is such an enjoyable time. Now, I've been working on uh, someone's cult who is not a Christian, and it has been both an exciting uh, experience, but also it's been it's really been a growth thing for me uh, to take people with me and let them hear me talk about the gospel, talk about the kingdom of God, talk about the work of God, the ways of God, and use horses to do it. And so one of the first things, you know, that, that I was introduced to when I was on this journey this month was a, a man that really doesn't want to be churched, and he's unchurched, and he doesn't want to be in a church, and he definitely, and to some degree, has articulated, I just don't want it rammed down my throat. And so I knew I was on pretty thin ice getting started. But it has been a remarkable experience. Now, also, God has opened up some doors for me to start, officially start Second Chance Ranch and um, here in Calgary. And so I'm so thankful for that. And I've noticed in my life that every time, in my adult life at least, every time I touch horses, God just gets all involved. And so I recognize that this is part of my, you know, if you have a career and you have a job and then you want to make extra money, you have a side hustle, they call it, right? A side job. And um, money or no money uh, about this, every ministry has a side hustle, a side job that they do. Paul's was tent making, mine is training and, and starting horses. And so, you know, I'm standing there and I'm, I'm teaching and, and I, I never miss an opportunity to teach both the gospel and the good things of the kingdom. So I'm standing there and, you know, this wonderful, beautiful family stand on the fence and they're watching me work with the colt and, and I ask them a question. So, okay, you're, gonna, you're getting ready to watch me do something, and I, I want to ask you guys a question. Do you know the difference between um, discipline and abuse? No, sir, we don't. I said it's consistency. Never, as a parent, never discipline your child because you're embarrassed, shamed, or just ticked or mad, but be consistent about it. And and hold them accountable and hold yourself accountable so you don't become a moody disciplinarian. And so in, in the horse training world, um, when you're starting a colt and you're laying the foundation, it, it basically works like this. You ask, you tell, you demand every time. If you tell him what to do and you demand him to do something without asking him, you're abusing that horse because you're not giving that horse an adequate chance to do the right thing. So when I'm, when I'm doing horses and, and I want him uh, to move, and, and say, for instance, I, I have him in the round pen, I'm going to raise my hand and point. When I raise my hand and point, that's the ask. Move out in that direction. I'm showing you that I'm the predator or the alpha mare in this herd, okay? And so you go like that, and that's the ask. If they don't move out then, depending on what they're wanting their colt to be trained at, some people smooch or kiss or cluck or click, 
you know, and this particular couple has asked me to train their horses that the move out is, and so, and if they don't do that, I have a carrot stick that has an extension, basically an extension of my arm, and you you spank the ground. Boy, that really puts the pressure. Look how dramatic my body language is if you're watching this. And so you ask, you tell, you demand. If you go right to the demand stage, you're not giving that horse an opportunity, okay? And so basically in horse training, you want to make the right thing really easy and the wrong thing really hard. To do that, you know, so I'm standing there. Now think about this. I'm on the fence talking to this unchurched couple. They're not believers and don't actually know that they want anything to do with, you know, church, but yet I get an opportunity to preach to them. And so I'm doing it. They don't know I'm doing it at that moment. But so I get that horse and I'm moving it around and I'm explaining, you know, discipline and I'm explaining why, you know, I said a lot of people think rules are just, you know, whatever. So when I get to the back of a trailer, I want to take the rope and I want to raise my hand with the rope in it. I want to click and I want that horse to get right into that trailer. I don't want to be in there because basically that horse is he's a domesticated horse. He's a quarter horse. He's never been a wild Mustang, but all that inherent nature is in him, right? So they are a flight and fright horse, an animal. The horses, uh, if they kick at you, they're more or less saying, I can't go anywhere and you're going to get out of my space and I'm going to disrespect you. But basically, a horse, if it has the land and the opportunity, it is going to go into flight mode. It's going to run, right? So what what is a horse trailer? Well, it's a cave on wheels. And you want to put them in head first and their hind ends facing out. And, and they're back there in this cave. And, and all of their instincts are saying, oh, my goodness, this is terrible because this is a threat, right? So you don't want to be in there. You want to smooch them in, send them in, let them go to their place. And then you come in behind them. You're touching them. You're rubbing on them. You clip under that back out, put the divider in, drop the pin, you step out. Same thing. When you want them out, you want to send them and ask them out. You don't want them charging, barging, right? Because your little girl or your your dog may be back there or the cliff may be back there and they come flying out of that trailer and they're going to kill or hurt something, right? So you want them to trust you that learning and guidance is great because it keeps them safe, you safe, and everyone else safe, right? So I'm teaching about this. So I, he said, so what is the number one thing you're trying to teach this horse right now by all these little things you're doing? I said, well, I'm trying to teach him to have a teachable spirit. Because if I can teach him to have a teachable attitude, then I have his mind and he's not living in react mode and he's not just wanting to bolt and, you know, just flee. So here's, here's, here's a concept that Nike promotes in some of their branding and some of their advertising. Um, Nike promotes this saying, and it's really applicable to horses. It's applicable to people as well. And it's, it simply says uncoachable kids become unemployable adults. Let your kids get used to someone being tough on them. It's life. That's, that's Nike's version of what I'm talking about. And so if you have someone that cannot be coached, cannot be taught, they cannot be employed. Because basically uncoachable people, kids, grow up to be unemployable adults. Well, unteachable spirits in people grow up to become unleadable sheep in the kingdom of God, okay? So what we're going to talk about is a little bit about what is the difference between abuse and discipline. And again, I've already said it's consistency. Now, I don't know if you've read the book. These are two of my favorite books. Uh, the first book that is, is the book the prelude to the one I'm going to talk about is Crucial Conversations. Most anybody and everybody has read that, okay? But there's a follow-up book uh, that's called Crucial Accountability, okay? And the writer in, in Crucial Accountability, 
this this author lays out in in this and it's actually several author, authors and I just know it as Patterson but I think there's like four four other authors that co-authored it with them but nonetheless Patterson lays out in this book a concept called CPR content pattern relationship here's an example okay you want to hold people accountable but you don't want to go right to the nth degree to implement accountability think about this and this is the example and i preached about this a few weeks ago in truth church the first time a teenager comes home late the content is breaking the curfew that's problem if she promises to stick to the rules but doesn't there's an additional issue she now has a pattern of rule breaking Let's say the father and daughter discuss the pattern and there's a renewed commitment to the rule, but days later she breaks the curfew again, almost and seemingly intentional. There is now a further problem. At this point, her father can't trust her, which means the negative effect on their relationship is another problem. In addition to considering the content, which is, you know, they come home late, but the pattern is they keep coming home late and the relationship begins to deteriorate because the father's trying to reason with her and she doesn't understand. So he might be frustrated by what he assumes are his daughter's intentions. And that could be she's just breaking the rules to aggravate him or has a rebellious spirit. Now, there are many clues that your accountability issue should be addressed. Uh, one is if, if, if hostility enters in. So you're not a bad guy. And, and this is a, a great, and my next episode is going to be a follow-up to this. So we'll work on this in two parts. But the next one is the common belief among Christians that you cannot judge. You know, oh, you're a Christian, you can't judge. Um, we'll look into that. And the other common kind of misconception about Christianity is, oh, you're a Christian, you have to shut up and just be a doormat. No, Jesus, the, really read, read Matthew chapter 23. The whole Matthew 23 thing is Jesus holding these preachers and these priests accountable saying, look, you can't abuse people like this and get by with it. You have a pattern of this abuse, and this has caused your relationship with God to break down and also other people's relationship to break down, okay? And so there is a time to confront or to have a crucial conversation and to hold someone crucially accountable. The key message here is to motivate a change in behavior, you have to explain why there's consequences. Now, whoa, man. Many people hear the word consequences and imagine things like detention or getting fired or getting rebuked, but using consequences to motivate doesn't have to mean that I resort to threats of punishment or banishment. All actions and behaviors have their own natural consequences. For instance, a man who constantly makes sarcastic digs at his wife will eventually push her away by drawing attention to the natural consequences of his action. You can nudge him to do the right thing. Now, when you're having these accountability discussions, highlight the natural consequences that the other person may not be aware of. And so, you know, anybody who is, who is looking at this especially a walk with God and uh, a, a work of the Spirit, they're, they're really turned off by all the rules and all the regulation, you know. So I want you to imagine, here I am talking to this unchurched family, and I start explaining why little things matter. And so w what, what people often see in developing people, training horses, developing anything that you're wanting to grow into a functional adult or state of maturation and in that state function healthily you have to teach them discipline you have to teach them accountability okay and so this is what Matthew chapter 18 lays out in the kingdom of God he's telling you if your brother offends you 
Don't just go away and take it because you're a Christian. Leave your gift at the altar. Go to your brother. Well, so I said, well, I can get over that. That wasn't a big deal, right? Somebody said something to me not long ago, and it was hurtful, and it was rather rude. And I thought to myself, man, well, that really bothers me that they would say that. And so it, it got to bothering me, and, you know, it came up a couple times in my spirit, and I didn't do anything about it right away because really, you know, I felt like such a big baby about it. And like, do you really want to go whining around every time somebody says something? And so, you know, I'm, I'm in my you know, devotional prayer and just talking to the Lord. And I'm explaining to the Lord this small thing and why I'm not going to go to them because it's so petty. It's so little that although it does offend me that they said it, they, that they felt not just that they said it, but that they felt comfortable enough to say something that was hurtful and rude like that. But, you know, I have a magnificent forgetfulness. So it's it's a great blessing. Like anything that happens, it's just like a matter of days and I can't remember it. I, I can remember stuff I read in books and I can remember all kinds of other stuff. I can't really remember all the little details of stuff. And I think that's part of the anointing. The anointing helps you forget or else you'd remember all the garbage anyone ever says or confesses to you or that you got to deal with. And the anointing helps you get over it, right? And get beyond it. And so I've had people that have confessed things to me in in my life. And then they come back in and say, I don't know, eight months later, a year later. And they're like, you remember when I told you I did blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just froze on. Like, I actually remember that we had a really authentic, transparent, and great conversation that seemed to be moving in a healthy and healing direction. I actually don't remember the details of why you were actually in there. Well, I did this to this person. I'm like, oh, man. So, you know, they bring it all up, and then it's like it's in my head again, you know. So I, I oftentimes stop people and say, now, I just want you to know you, you're welcome to talk to me about whatever you want to say, but I just want you to know that what, you, what you're mentioning and you said, remember when I told you, I just want you to know I don't have any recollection of that. And that quite possibly could be because God has so forgiven and remitted your sins that he helps us in the anointing forget it so we don't keep a scorecard against the people that we're leading or, or working with. So anyhow, that's kind of the MO of how I live. So I always anticipate that after a little while I'm going to forget anyhow. And so no big deal. If I can weather the storm for a couple months, I probably won't remember it, you know, in 60 days from now. So no, no big deal. But as I was praying, the Lord kept prompting me, you, you need to talk to that person. And I'm like, God, you know, I'm a, I'm a bigger man than that. You know, I, I don't want to even let them know that that even got up under my skin or, you know. And the Lord spoke to me in my spirit and just said, oh, so it's only about you. What if the whole accountability thing is because they have a pattern of abuse and a pattern of joking about things they shouldn't be joking? And let me tell you guys something. The reason jokes are funny and they have that shock and awe value is because there's a kernel and measure of truth in every joke. So even though you say, oh, I was just joking, right, yeah, I get it. But there's a measure of truth in it. That's why it was a joke. That's why it was funny. That's why it was a bit of shock and awe because there does have to be a kernel of truth. If I tell a joke of something that can't happen, it's just like, okay, he's telling you some kind of, it's, a, it's called a riddle. For a joke to be a joke or a jesting comment to be a jesting comment, it has to have some dig or element of truth to it or else it's not funny. It's just a baffling riddle that you're supposed to figure out like a mental Rubik's Cube. Anyhow, oh, I'm, I, I really don't want to go talk to this person and, and I really don't want to hold them accountable for what they said and why they said it and yeah, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I feel silly and stupid, and I'm a bigger man than that. And my pride got involved. The Lord kept pestering me about it and said, okay, you're trying to act like you weren't offended. You're not offended now, 
but at the moment you was, and it lasted for a while. And the reason that I had them do that to you and emboldened them to do that so they would expose a pattern of abuse in their life that you, because they love you and they respect you. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's what Matthew 18 is about. You go to your brother. Why not? Is it the end of the world between me and him or me and her? No, but could it possibly be that, that they're doing things and they don't see themselves and in a spirit of meekness and true, genuine Christian reflection, they might be able to come to a place of revelation and realization. I go to them. I have this conversation about it. They tell me about half a dozen other things that they had said to other people. And it was like, you know, kind of what they said to me was kind of like, that's where you came from. That's, you know, that's your upbringing. That's still in you. And it's just like, I really don't want that, you know, said like that, you know. But when I started talking to them, they said, you know, I didn't bring up your past or your sin, but seems like I have a pattern in my life where I bring up and poke at people's past. And they told me some stuff that they had said, and I, I really got a chance to, you know, operate in the spirit there and, and, and lay out the word of God and explain to them that you're digging under the blood is what you're doing. And, and your joke, your jesting is really harmful to both you and them as a Christian. You know, and so I, I kind of use that scenario to explain to you why little things matter. So the ask, tell, demand that I'm doing in the horse training, Jesus does this in Matthew 18. If your brother offends you, go to your brother. Ask him. Talk to him. And if he says, I'm sorry, and, and you guys get it sorted out, you've won your brother, go away and shut your mouth. You don't tell 10 other people. You'd worked it out between you and him alone. It, now, if they don't hear you, go get two or three witnesses. Demand that I need, I, I need this resolved. This isn't healthy. This is toxic. This is abusive. If they don't do that, take them before the church or the body of governing elders in a church and the representative body of the church, however you want to read that and possibly it will come to excommunication or or disfellowshipping Paul did that and you have to sometimes amputate something so that it doesn't corrupt the whole body but at each time the difference between church government and abusive authoritarianism is consistency and scriptural application so all these people that resist authority and I man has no right to tell me it's like okay when they say oh it's abusive because this and this happened but if it's scriptural it's not abusive it's consistent they privately got asked then they got told and then there was a demand so you have the ask the tell the demand and you watch Jesus do this over and over and over again in his ministry and it comes up to a point of why is this important? Because little things compound to major disasters, right? So I was explaining to them, you know, that that the rules, people get so wrapped up in looking at the rules of church. And like, I'm not going to church. You can't do this and you can't do that. And I said, okay, what is the difference between a rule and an autocratic dictatorial mandate or demand? And they said, I, I don't know. I said, well, a rule has a reason behind it. An autocratic demand just has a rant or a mood behind it. And so as a pastor, I have no authority outside of the word of God. I can't just arbitrarily be slapping demands on people. But if there's a rule in the in the construct of Christianity, then I must understand that there's got to be reasoning beyond it. That's the difference. Okay, so I tell this story. Now, mind you, when I'm out there in the field, and I, I think Shane Green was here with me this particular morning, and Shane had been riding out, and we'd been working on the cold a little bit, and we had a wonderful time to fellowship. 
But Shane's standing there on the fence watching me talk to this unchurched couple. And I'm just launching into rules. And, you know, man, people look at that. And, you know, and I explain this situation. We knew a man in Southern California that was a farrier. That's a shoer. And he had a lovely little girl. And I don't know how old the little girl was. She was pretty young. And she was just an adorable little girl. Um, and he just couldn't really hold her accountable. And so he would, you know, he was kind of one of those, I'm going to count three. One, two, three, three, three. You listen, three, two, one, one. I'm counting one. I mean, this go on and on until you're just like, it's ad nauseum, right? And so he, he was working up on a horse one day at a ranch. And this horse was kind of infamous for being a kicker. And that little girl, you'd tell her to do something, you know, so whatever. She'd never obey what she's told to do, right? She gets out of the car. She sees her daddy over there next to that horse, and she bolts for that horse. And that daddy screams, stop, 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 okay? She never stopped. She got up towards that horse. That horse reared up and let both hooves go and kicked that little girl and killed her. Okay, now here's the deal. I got my kids were young, very young. I got all my kids together. And man, as a dad that that had a bunch of horses in the backyard and was training horses that we were unfamiliar with, God have mercy. My spirit was like in panic mode. I got all my children together and I told them that story. And I mean, I was broken up about it. I'm telling them, guys. I don't want to lose you. I love you. Okay, we're going to implement a new rule here. Okay, when dad says stop, you don't walk three more steps, four more steps. You don't walk on. You make skid marks. Stop. Like if you went up to Preston or Grace or Avi right now, I don't really remember what Paxton's age bracket was and all this, but if you went up to one of them three older ones and said, hey, what's the rule when you was a kid if your dad yelled stop? And they'd say, make skid tracks, turn around, look at them. And I'd point to them which way to go. Don't go there, go this way, okay? Now, in the first three or four months when I'd say stop and they'd just keep running another 10 yards or 15 yards, I'd have to discipline them to let them know. I am holding you accountable for the agreement. And because it is life and death, there's a reason, guys. Do you want us to get rid of horses and get all these little battery-operated cars and that'll never run over you or whatever? That's fine. But if we're going to have horses, we need this rule, okay? And so my kids understood that. Now, as my kids got older, they got a little bit older, and their friends would come over, and I'd, I'd you know, stop. And these kids, you know, they, man, they just, like, make skid marks. Well, their friends looked at them like, they, they, you know, your dad's a dictator, man. Your dad's some autocratic control freak. What's his deal? Stop, and you got to make skid marks in the dirt? What does that mean? And my little girls would explain, he loves us so much that he wants us to listen to this rule. Because there's a reason, right? And so as a leader, whether you're leading a horse or leading a youth group or leading a church or leading a family or leading teenagers, you have to explain crucial accountability. So here I am talking to this man, laying out. I said, you know, I said, I know I, I'm, I'm not going to shove Bible down your throat and all that, I said, but there's a beautiful scripture in the New Testament that says the love of God constraineth us. We think the hold back is just the resistance and God's just some kind of, you know, morbid creature that's, you know, against fun. And that's not the truth. The truth is, is that God loves you so much. There's a reason on the other side of that rule. There could be a danger. There could be a life-threatening catastrophe, either to yourself or to your family or to your church or to your children or marriage. But whatever it is, when God implements a rule in your life, there is always a reason behind it. And so what God is doing is laying the groundwork in our spirits so that we can have a teachable spirit 
so that we can make righteous and godly decisions and we can decide based on the experience of truth and revelation that we have. And that's the beauty of being held accountable by God is it is not to prove that he is just a controller. It is to prove that I trust him to control my life.